Hello there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter, along with Sarah. Hello! And we are going to paint uh, an Easter lily today. I figure it'd be kind of fun because people ask me how to paint white flowers. And um, Easter is Sunday, so... Easter is Sunday. Yeah! So do you have any big plans for Easter? Um, John and I are going to the early service to church, and that's about it. Oh, nice. We're going to have Easter dinner down at my sister's. So, nice. Yeah, nice. so that's going to be fun. It's always nice to get together. We're not a terribly religious family, so it's just a good excuse to, to get together and see one another. Mm. And candy, of course. That's the mm. this candy. John will be excited. But I don't do candy, so. No. Well, I do hope everyone has a very safe and wonderful Easter holiday. We are going to be using a watercolor paint that's kind of new to me. This is the Rembrandt watercolors. And I got this great deal at Jerry's Artorama uh, a couple months ago. And they I checked this morning. They still have it. And I have a coupon code for you. It's 20% off and free shipping on orders over $49. It's frugal20fs49. You don't have to write it down. Look in the video description. It's right there. Um, it is not eligible on... On, uh, sale or clearance items so just look for the little green icon it looks like a little coupon clipping scissors if you're curious um, so basically if the thing is like a screaming deal then it's probably not going to be coupon eligible but for all your regular the, the Jerry regular price stuff which is still like half the price of what you pay in stores um, you can save 20% so and get your stuff shipped for free so I did a little chart with those Rembrandt paints because it's just uh, that set that, I, that I've linked to uh, has um, seven colors. It's got a split primary palette plus a burnt sienna, which is really great. Uh, if you kind of look down the diagonal, you can see the true colors on their own, and they're just super clean and vibrant. Um, they're they're just wonderful, and I wanted to use them today. And the other reason I wanted to use these is because we're going to be doing very subtle coloring. So I want to show you how you can tone down your colors. You you're always better off to start brighter and go um, go more muted because you can always mute down a color, but you can't always make it brighter. And uh, what I've done here, since I, I when I get a, a new tube of paint to try, I don't put it in my big palette. What I do is put it in little half pans, and I put a magnet on the back, and um, I keep them in a tin. And um, I needed more room to mix, so I just took this colored pencil tin, and I just set them here on the, because I don't want them to slide around on a glass plate, so I knew they would stay, like, kind of in one spot for me while it worked. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure you type the word question in all caps, or you could probably put a couple question marks uh, before your question. No, so we'll just leave it question leave it, in okay. all caps. It's a lot easier. Okay, just we we won't mess question with it. all caps. <laughs> I saw somebody else doing that. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. But we'll just stick to the we'll stick to the basics. Um, that way, Sarah can see it and relay it to me, or the moderators can help you out. It, and if we miss you, we're only um, we're only human, so there's a chance that we can miss something. So please don't hesitate to ask again if if uh, the chat goes by fast. Um, now, when I was doing my practice one, I was just working in my thin paper Jane Davenport journal. And um, when you're working on thinner paper, you notice it's less absorbent. So you're going to get harder edges, harder lines. The edges of like your washes will be will be more hard edged. Um, it's also if you're working with a wood paper. So I do recommend you work with a cotton paper today if you have it, because it's going to get, give you the um, option of a little more subtle and softer edges. Um, and thicker paper, obviously, is a little bit more absorbent, so you're not going to get such crisp, hard edges, and we want a little bit more of a softer look. But yeah, I like to practice on less expensive paper because then I feel free to play with colors and whatnot. Also, on that flower, I did my flower first and the background second, but I think we'll do the background first this time because I um, I prefer to have my background in first because there's nothing more um, inhibiting than having a beautifully painted a subject and then trying to put a background in around it. So what I'm doing is just using one of these mimic brushes. This is the number 12 round and I'm wetting my background. Sometimes when you're using especially cotton paper, you might have to go and wet it again because and this can actually happen on any paper. You'll wet it and the the um water will kind of absorb in then you'll have to go and wet it again. So if that happens, that's what you do, especially when the weather gets warmer. And Arches or Langton Prestige would be perfect for this. I'm using Langton Prestige because I had a piece of paper cut the right size when I went to uh, sketch it out. And the pattern is linked in the video description. I like to tip it to the light and you can see where you have um, wet the paper and where you haven't. So did people manage to find the uh, the live stream today? I was very late getting everything no, together. No, yeah, no, we weren't late. We were right on time. Oh, I know, but just preparing for everything, getting the word out, I was 
I don't know, out of sorts, not uh, not my most efficient self today. <laughs> it's Friday after all. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday on the eve of my kids, like, you know, the school vacation week, so. It's going to be madness. Madness. Yeah. These mimic brushes are coupon eligible, even though they are a fantastic price. They you can use a coupon on them. I think you'll find that's the case with most of Jerry's house brand items. Sandra James would like to know what size the paper is. Oh gosh, this is probably uh, it's like an eighth of a sheet of a full of like a imperial sheet, so that would be eleven by eight, I think. You take one of those big sheets and you chop it down. I, I, I rip them in half and then half again and then half again and sometimes in half again. So uh, so this would be an eighth of that of a full sheet size. That's how I typically get my paper is in the full sheets and I tear it down. It's a little more economical. It's a little less convenient. You have to have a place to store it. But, um, but it's nice to have the option of having whatever size you want. All right, so for our background, um, this we can actually do a lot of different colors because our flower petals are white. Um, so we'll just be adding kind of highlights and shadows um, or we'll be adding layers of, of shadows to them. So I think I'm going to go with some warmer yellow up towards the top and that will give us kind of like a warmth, kind of like indication of a sun of like sunshine. You can see how lovely and bright these colors are right off the brush. I'll be ha I'll be doing a review on these paints once I've had a little bit of <clears throat> excuse me a little more practice with them. <coughs> excuse me. Um, but for right now, I'm just kind of getting used to them. They do seem to be on par with um, any other artist grade paint, but I thought they would be because I've used the Van Gogh, which is their student line, and, and that's really fantastic. And a lot of people even consider their Van Gogh line to be artist quality. I think I'll do a little mixing. I'm going to mix a little phthalo blue into this warm yellow. It'll still give us a really pretty green, even though it's not a, a lemon yellow th that I have out here right now. Uh, Zach Penn, can you use watercolor crayons to sketch with before painting? Sure. Yeah, or watercolor pencils, whatever you prefer. So you could use any warm yellow, you could use a cad yellow medium or cad yellow deep or gamboge or Indian yellow, whichever um, yellow you have and you enjoy. Uh, Pepper Hearts, how do you control how much water you put on the painting for a wash? Well, I like to wet the paper first and then make sure it's kind of like a, um, like a sheen, has a sheen to it. When I tip it to the light, you can see this kind of like, a, well, I think, let's see if I tip that, if, oh, it's just kind of glaring really bad. Um, I like to look and make sure it's got kind of a satin sheen to it, and then I know it's it's just about where I I like to have it. You might want, you know, if you want to run sorry about that, if you want a runnier wash, you could have a little uh, more water on there and have it really glossy looking. Something like I'm having to go in here and add a little more water because it's starting to dry on me under these lights. Art relaxation. Is it okay to laminate watercolor or acrylic paintings? Um, well, it really depends. I mean, if you're like turning your watercolor painting into a bookmark or something, then there won't be a problem with it. I, you're going to, it will devalue it, I think, as far as like, if you, if you ever want to sell it, I think it would make it worth less. But, and, and with acrylic, I wouldn't eliminate acrylic because acrylic is actually a plastic and I think it might melt. All right. It might, I would think too, it might turn yellow. Like there would be yellow spots on the laminate. Oh, you think so? I don't oh, know. Yeah, I mean, they. I guess it would depend on what's in the paints against the laminate. Hmm. Plus, usually, if you get something professionally laminated, it uses a it uses a high level of heat. Oh, more than like a home laminator. Yeah, like if you have them professionally oh, done, it's kind of like a higher level of heat, so you could theoretically burn or melt, like you were saying. You know, right? Which is probably not the look you're going for. Yeah, I've a. Uh... I remember I was making ID badges for uh, people in the Girl Scout troop and I had all the parents give me photos and one woman gave me a photo and it was like 
it, it turned completely black when I laminated it. It was like, it must have been like a photocopy or something, but okay. it went completely black. I'm making some of this. Uh, the cool red that comes in this set that I linked to is a PV19, but it's a it's a permanent red violet, which is it's much more purple than, um, than other reds. There's also a nice deep, like a cadmium red hue, I think, in that set. So you do get a nice variety, but I just think that's kind of pretty. And I'm adding it in. If that's a little too crazy color-wise for me, you don't have to do it. But I think it is going to really give us some nice contrast. Now, if you get some puddles, you want to put your brush, dry your brush off, stick it in the puddle, soak up that extra um, paint. And that will keep you, keep you from getting those cauliflower-like blooms on your paper. And if you do it with a brush instead of a paper towel, you're less likely to end up with like fluffy clouds where you're removing your paint. It will just kind of the paint will redistribute um, itself into those areas. And if you but if you do feel like you have way too hard of an edge, you can gently blot. Just kind of turn it so you're getting a different part of the paper each time so you don't end up with a super hard edge uh, if you don't want one. Veona uh, Narkuli. How do you apply a flat wash without applying water to the paper first? You do what's called a, if you're doing a large area or a larger area, you do what's called a controlled wash and you make a, um, you make a, a bead of water across the top of the pa paper and then you add in color and you keep adding color into that bead till it's about ready to drip and then you work the, um, you work the paint, you just keep doing horizontal strokes until you have, carried that down till there's not very much paint left in the bead then you add more paint to the bead only and then you keep on working i have a video on three ways to do a watercolor wash on my channel if you want to investigate that a little bit further i'm adding some of that red into those two blues ultramarine and thalo and i'm adding that into the uh background too because i want to have a nice colorful dark background to make our flower really show up uh, Patricia Hank, is your new crafty class on watercolor, and do you know when it will be available? I can't speak on that at the at the moment, actually. All right, so I've got a lot of psychedelic colors in here. If you decided this was too bold for you, you can take a paper towel and you can scrunch it up, and you can um, you can blot some away, and that will just give you a softer look. And if you want to dull things down, add the opposite. So if I add yellow on top of this purple, it's going to muddy it up a little bit because they're opposites. Well, that's a great thing about doing your background first is that you can play with all of these colors without worrying about ruining your painting because you haven't put that much time into it yet. I find that cotton paper stays more uniformly um, uh, more uniformly wet so you don't get so many hard edges when you're going around. I think I'm going to get some of this other yellow in there. This is more of our lemon. This will give us a brighter green. And I'll, I mixed it in with the rest of that yellow too because it was very bright. Uh, Heiko, which paints do you find most comparable to M. Graham's? I know they're your favorite, but they're expensive to ship where I live. Um, gosh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of really good ones. I don't know where you live, but Windsor Newton is available everywhere, and that's a good quality paint. Um, I've actually really been liking Mission Gold lately, and some places that's really, really cheap. Um, Daniel Smith, of course, that might be a hard one, too, if you're having a hard time with Mission Gold, uh, with um, M. Graham, because they're both American-made paints. If, if it's American-made paints, you're having a hard time getting. Uh, these Rembrandt ones are really nice. They're just as good. I think any, like, major brand of artist watercolor, you're going to have pretty good luck with. I, I mean, in the differences between a lot of them are very small. It's more of just, like, personal preference in most cases. I love trying out a bunch of different ones. You don't need to have every brand. I just have a, like a art supply sickness. <laughs> I did not get rid of a single watercolor palette in my, uh, my big craft room cleanup. 
Uh, Joy Hawkins, do you know of an equivalent color to compare to Schminky Brilliant Red Violet color? Ah, uh, you know, I don't know that color right off the top of my head. I don't have that many tubes of Schminka, and I, I don't think that's a color I have. So, yeah, I don't know. Look at the pigment number and then see what, if it's a single pigment, see if you can find out, like, what, if you go to, there's a web, website called um, Handprint. They have a really comprehensive list of um, colors and pigment information, and you can it'll tell you what pigments used by what companies, and that way you could like cross reference it with other companies who use that. And he rates um, the different the different companies by like who's you know who does that color best. And um, I mean, it's it take it with a grain of salt because it's one person's opinion. But that's really good. And there was another one I can't remember what it was, but it also broke up, broke up like the color pigments. Um, Institute of Colors. I can't remember. It's um, if you search color pigment information, it'll probably come up just right in your um, right in your search engine. Uh, Bia Makani, I have I was I'm asked to do a demo color theory using watercolors at a local art store tomorrow. Any ideas of what should I should demo apart from color wheel and the mixing chart? Um, color theory, you said. Uh, demo color theory theory using watercolors. I, I would do like a split complementary color mixing chart. You know, would use a warm and a cool of each primary, and uh, that would be probably the. That wouldn't get it too complicated. If you overcomplicate it, you're going to lose people. Mm. I think I want to grab some salt from the kitchen and sprinkle okay. that on there while it's still wet. Oh, I'm chewy. I'm That's all right. Me. She'll ah. stay right in the way and <laughs> look at you like you're a jerk for trying to step I'll over. I'll seriously her. right back. I'm just going to grab the salt off the counter. Do do do. So it's springtime here in Maine. Uh, almost sixty degrees. Lovely breeze. Some green grass coming out. Snow banks are pretty much gone. So we're uh, we're all happy about that. The pool is melting. The ice in the pool is melting. There we go. And salted. Uh, Springer, Maine. I purchased tracing paper. Is there an issue with leaving residue with this method? Um, I have found some that some do and some, oh wait, tracing or? Tracing paper. No, I never had residue with tracing paper. Sometimes some graphite papers will leave a waxy film because they use kind of, I think, a wax binder to keep it on the paper. Um, but it's not, um, it's not everyone. I'm trying to think. The low Cornell is what I usually use, and that's not too waxy. Um, but, and, and Su Susan Shiwi makes one. And uh, that's probably not very waxy either because she is a watercolorist. Lil Cornell generally does theirs for acrylic painters, so there could be a waxy bind, like a little bit of waxy in it. But if you get, uh, probably the Sushiwi wouldn't be. Um, so I think Jerry's has the Sushiwi products too. Um, yeah, or anything that's designed for watercolor should be fine. I am going to nudge this uh, along with the heat tool. Um, usually if you do speed up the drying, the salt effect is minimized. And plus I put it on when it was, um, a little damp, so it's not going to be completely like huge, like textures, but it'll give us some. Um, yeah, it'll give us some. Uh, Kendall McCauley, when making paintings to sell, what is the most economical size? Um, probably framed to eleven by fourteen. When you when you have a sixteen by twenty, that that gets kind of big for people. Um, eleven fourteen is kind of a little substantial, but it's not. Um, it's not rinky dinky. That seems to be the, and that's an inexpensive size to frame. So that's probably what I would recommend if you're, if you're uh, buying it on, if you're making it on spec and you don't have definite buyers for things. Mats are fairly inexpensive and you can find them that size. You don't have to cut them if you don't want to. He also looks like a snowstorm on Easter. It's so very vain. <laughs> It's supposed to be nice on Easter, but I have, I remember the kids collecting Easter eggs in the snow with their snow boots and, no, I think rain boots and winter jacket and just snow and it was miserable. Well, they didn't care. They got candy. <laughs> Homeschool for two. Is there a way to also find out the pigment info for Prima Marketing? I have the Tropical set in the classics. They do not release their pigment information. They do have a light fast chart on their website. Um, I have a feeling that their watercolors are made by Mungyo. So, I mean, I can't, I can't prove it. Obviously I'm not a, I'm not the manufacturer, but I, I think they may be made by Mungyo. So if you want to cross reference that with the Mungyo website, um, they're a Korean paint maker and they do private label for different companies. You can check that out and see if you can 
you know, find out any information. I kind of put the Prima Marketing watercolors in the category of fun, very well behaving, but you know, just be cautious if you're gonna if you're gonna paint something that's going to um, be on display or potentially sell because we, you know you just don't know. Chris Crafts, do you have any tips to slow watercolor drying in the paper? Where I live, it is very hot and dry and usually don't have time for blending and washes. Um, you can stretch your watercolor paper on a stretcher frame, like the kind that um, oil and acrylic painters use. You just wrap your, you wet your paper, wrap it around, staple it down, and you can wet the paper on the back with water. So you just flip it upside down, dump a you know, jug of water on it, flip it back over, wet the front side, and that will keep the entire um, sheet of the paper wet so you'll be able to keep it uh, damp longer. A lot of plein air painters do that because if you're painting outside, even in Maine in the summer, it gets everything just dries out so quick on you. And you can reuse your stretcher bars. Just un, um, just cut off the staples when you're done. Pull them out with pliers, and uh, and you can stretch another piece on there. You do lose a few inches on each side, so it's not the most economical, but it is a way to get around it. I've done it before. It's nice, very nice to paint on. It's like painting on a drum head. Uh, Joy Hawkins, where can I purchase your heat gun you use? This is the Ranger one. It's now it now comes in black, but I think any craft store, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I don't like think any big box or if you don't have one near you, probably Amazon or eBay or any sort any craft supply like a rubber stamping, especially because that is an yep. embossing heat tool. So anywhere where they sell stamping supplies, you could get one. And those, that one, I, I have that same one. I've had it forever. It's so much quieter than the Marvy one that I have. Yeah. I don't know if it's quite as high power, but I love how quiet it is. And I don't burn my paper with that. And I burn my, I burn, I occasionally burn my paper with my Marvy oh, one. Oh, really? Yeah. And I got one of those, uh, cause I figured, well, I might need a backup. So I like to stockpile things and I bought, and I saw at Harbor Freight, they had a heat gun for a dual temperature heat gun for seven bucks on sale that thing gets so hot and i was really afraid to use it because the the metal part kind of sticks out a bit and it gets so hot and um even in a low setting it's hotter than than what i want so i actually gave that to my husband and i was cleaning through my craft room because i was afraid the kid would try to use it and get hurt on it or i would catch up to catch something on fire with it so and you can use a hair dryer too. You don't have to use a heat gun for watercolor drying. All right, I kind of like that texture. I think that's kind of cool looking. I like it. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to work on some petals here. We're going to start on this one back here. And um, I have a reference photo here. Um, you can just, this one doesn't really have that many colors in there. But what you need to do is, is look for your shadows, look for your colors, and totally saturate them. So you're exaggerating any of the colors you see. So what we're going to start is back here, this kind of dull green. And um, I just, just to interrupt, we had a question yep. that had to do with the salt. Effect. Oh, yeah. Uh, Pepper Hearts, does the size of the salt affect the affect the end effects? I like chunky salt, bigger effect. Like, yes. So bigger, chunky salt, bigger, chunkier salt, bigger effects, fine salt, thinner effect. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is just table salt. If you use a kosher salt, um, you're going to get a bolder look. Also, if your paper's wetter, when you put your salt on, you're going to get bigger stars. So... Uh, so it has to do with both the um, the size of the granules and also how wet your paper is. Because, I mean, there's some pretty big sizes in here because the paper was really wet down there. Um, I'm taking a little bit of that, that reddish mauve color, that um, permanent red-violet, and adding it to some of the green mix that I have. So I end up with this kind of grayish-brown-green. And since it's a fairly small area, I'm just going to go right in and paint that. We'll be doing a lot of transparent layers because um, we've got this crazy bold background. We want the flower itself to be much more subtle so we have that contrast of texture and color. I'm going to grab a little bit of that yellow, the warm yellow, and maybe a little bit of burnt sienna because that's a little too acidic of a yellow. Homeschool for two. Did you have any trouble carrying on your art supplies when you were flying to the Bahamas? I'm going there next month. I want to make sure I can carry on my supplies without trouble. I didn't have any trouble at all. I did empty my water brush and my little um, container to fill it, but that was it. And actually, I think I came back and it was, and I had water and I didn't realize it, but they didn't give me any hard time. So, no, no, no Well, it's a very all. small. Right. It definitely is not. It'd be maybe like. It's not like, you know, a giant water bottle. Right. 
and actually as long as you go through security with an empty you can go in the bathroom and fill it i think that's what i did and i'm adding a little bit of that mauve color right over here next to this petal kind of the underside of that petal where the trumpet part of the flower goes into the pet becomes the petal just to give it that little bit of a shadow And now I'm going to move over to this petal because I don't really need to leave. I've got plenty of space. I don't have like two wet areas that are bothering each other. And I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be, I like those two colors together for a gray. Those kind of make a nice color. And I think I'm going to add a smidgen of ultramarine to it. Oops. So I've got kind of a cool gray. And I am just going to add this right along this edge here because this petal is underneath, so it's going to have more shadow. Get that center vein in there. Um, when you're doing white flowers, it's great if you can sketch on something that's not your finished painting and then transfer it because you don't want any ex extra lines, really. This is already so much easier to paint on this paper than the uh, journal that I was painting in earlier. So if you're having if you're having trouble, you might want to see what paper you're working on. That could be partially what's giving you a hard time. Let's soften these edges a little bit. And I can almost make out a little bit of a blush pink up there, purpley color. So I'm going to add in a little bit of that, just a tiny bit. You have to really um, be careful with how much pigment you put on there. In fact, I'll switch to a smaller brush. The Mimic um, Kalinsky are um, much stiffer, and they will give you uh, a little bit more control. They're not going to hold quite so much water. So if you if you find that the Mimic Squirrels are just too juicy, try the Mimic Kalinsky. They're a less absorbent brush, and they're a little stiffer, so they do give you a little bit more control. Uh, Don Williams, do you put some water in your paints before you start, or are they dry? They're dry. Um, the only time I really feel like I need to pre-wet my paints is if I am um, working with student grade or if I haven't used them in a long time. Generally, they're ready just to go right out of the gate. I'm going to add a little bit of yellow on that petal. I think I'll try the lemon. Very, very faint. That's too faint. doesn't show up. There we go. And you want to have a tissue in your hand at all times so that you can wipe your brush if you get too much on there. I'm going to try to avoid getting mud anywhere, though. So if you find two colors overlapping and they don't look very pretty, just kind of go over it with a damp brush and clean it up. So that petal, hopefully that sh that's... I'm going to tip it away from the light a little bit. I'm hoping you can see those colors. Sometimes things get super glary with the amount of lights I have to have on. Um, when I'm filming it, yeah, it does look pretty glary. Hopefully, you can see it like that now. It doesn't look glary from my end. Oh, good, because it doesn't. I. It's not a lot of color. It's very subtle. And now I think I will skip over to this petal here. And again, this time the shadow is a little bit more green. So I've got my green mix here, and I'm just having it. So it's the same three colors except it's more green. And I'm just going to add that right behind this long petal that's stretched out there. All the petals are the same length. It's just that every all the other petals are foreshortened except for that one. And that one is not very foreshortened, so you're seeing like the full length of it. I like to clean my brush, blot it off, and then just kind of drag along the edge so I don't have any harsh lines. We can always go back in and add more if we need to. Now, under this petal on here, we've got more of a blue shadow, so I'm going to grab a little more ultramarine. I think I got hit some phthalo blue in my ultramarine because it was showing up brown. There we go. And I think I'm going to get a little more purple, a little more green in that too, just because it's. I want to gray it down a little bit. A little burnt sienna in there too. So we got some complex mixes going on, but we have so much water in them that it's not too. It's uh, it's still very a uh, very subtle. So I've got that color in there, 
and I'm going to clean my brush and pull that out a little bit just so it's a little softer. So it's not that white flowers take longer or harder. It's just you have to be more precise where you put them and you have to be you have to work with the subtleties of the color. It's kind of like if you're putting on makeup, if if you wear makeup, um, when you have more time to apply your makeup, it's not that you wear more makeup, you just apply it more precisely. I need a little bit of kind of a blush in there, so I'm watering down the violet. Getting into a little bit of the gray because there's a little too much in there. I just want to have a little bit right there. Again, clean my brush and drag it out. I feel like how the palette looks right now, you could just take a picture of that or make a painting of it and sell it for like $5,000 in New York. The palette here? Just the palette, like just the lid with the squares and the random splotches. Oh, and it's kind of abstract, isn't it? Uh, v Rock. I was using Studler watercolor pencils, then I got the Derwent watercolor pencils recently. The color doesn't seem as easy to liquefy and spread like the Stadler. Am I doing something wrong? Um, the Derwents aren't aren't liquefying. Yes. Huh. Don't seem as easy to liquefy and spread. Huh. I don't. I've used both of those brands, and I've ne I haven't had a problem with the Derwents unless they're the new. They have a new academy line that's like um like a student line that I haven't used. So maybe that's the case. If they mention, if they come back and mention what um, which line. Yeah, because if it's the regular watercolor ones, they should blend just fine. I'm mixing up my color for the I'm gonna work on this petal here because I'm you know having a little space there, leaving a little space. And I've just made a kind of a soft, dull green. Uh, Jennifer Sierra, where did you get the watercolor pencils? I'm assuming the ones that are in the tin. Oh, those are... You can see partially. Oh, those are Prima Marketing watercolor pencils. Um, I got those from Hallmark Scrapbook quite a few, a couple of years ago. A wild carrot appeared. I have the core watercolor set of 12, but I want to incorporate more colors to my palette. What are useful, nice-to-have colors? Um, I don't know if that set has a cobalt teal. Their cobalt teal is really pretty if you want to stick with the core brand. Um, I'm grabbing a little burnt sienna here, a little bit of mauve, or permanent red violet, rather. Um, I, I don't know what's exactly in the 12 set, so I can't, I don't know what you might be lacking. Um, but I like cobalt teal. That's a really unique, fun color. If you don't have a yellow ochre, you probably do in that set. But in case you don't, then definitely a yellow ochre. That's a great color to have. Um, have a little more ultramarine in a mix here. Uh, what's another good one? I don't. I don't know. I mean, that's going to give you. That probably has most of the colors you would need. If you don't have sap green, I would put a sap green in the, on the list. Adding, whoops, I'm adding more of a blue shadow over here. So these these petals that are overlapping, that's where that they create the shadows on the other petals. Don't worry about really sharp shadows at this point because we can go in and add those later. We're trying to get kind of the undertones. I'm trying to keep things fairly soft. So if I have a hard line, I'm rinsing my brush, blotting it. So I just have a little bit of water on there and painting over the edge. If you have too much water on your brush, it'll come off your brush, go into the paper, and give you the cauliflowers. So if you want to avoid those blooms, just blot your brush off. And then the, the uh, water on your brush will mix with the paint right on the edge and kind of soak some of it back up so that you'll have that subtle shift in color that you're going for. So now I'm going to work on this petal here. And we're going to be getting into some of the green. It's like the underside of the trumpet area there. And I'm going to grab a little more ultramarine and add it to this uh, green that we mixed. So we get this nice cool green shadow color. And that's going to go 
in down here and I'm actually I'm just sticking with this number 12 round I thought I was gonna need to go to a smaller brush um, but I think with a cotton paper that's it's all the difference as far as like working in that uh, journal that I was working in before I was everything was puddly and I had to keep switching to a smaller brush because I was getting too much water the uh, cotton paper just can handle it a little bit better I think all right so I'm blot my brush off Joy Hawkins, are Primacolor pencils the same as my Derwent Inktense watercolor pencils? No, Inktense um, are a water-soluble ink, so once you wet them and they dry, they're permanent on your paper. So the Prima ones aren't. The Prima ones are beautiful and vibrant, they're just not, um, they're just not the same. Chloe Crass, can I use salt water to paint with or will that completely wreck my brushes? Um, I don't know what kind of effects you'll have on your brushes, but there is an artist on Instagram that uses salt water to paint with, and um, her work is lovely. Cindy Laid, Cindy Laid Art, I believe is the name. She's, I think she might be Australian. She has some beautiful work. A lot of uh, whales and sea creatures and stuff like that, and she does a lot of kind of wet into wet painting with uh, seawater. She collects seawater to, to paint with. I'm softening here with a damp brush. Um, so yes, you can. I don't know if it will corrode your paper. I don't know if it will corrode your brushes. Because here, I mean, I brush the salt off after I'm done. I've never had any problems with salt on painting on paper. Um, so I really wouldn't think it would it would bother. I mean, salt's corrosive to your vehicle, but your vehicle is metal, not paper. So Oh, well, it's a different kind of... It's a little different. Is it? Well, it's got some other stuff. Because they don't use, like, the salt, like table salt anymore. They use the liquid stuff. Oh, yeah? So it's not like the crunchy salt like when we were kids. It, so it's like a liquid sodium chloride. So it creates like an actual like layer. Oh, really? Huh. That you can't see mixed in with the water and the slush. And that that's why the salt from the roads is so much more corrosive. Oh, interesting. I had no idea. Yeah. Uh, Cheryl Collier, when you paint, do you, do you have the finished painting in your head or do you see it gradually as you paint it? Um, it really depends. Sometimes I have much more of an idea of how it's going to come out than other times. Uh, sometimes I'm completely surprised, especially if I'm doing mixed media. It's um, way more, way <laughs> less of, I have way less of an idea of how it's going to come out than uh, like a watercolor. So, cause I think it's, I'm just much more experienced doing watercolor. Art by C. Riley. Where, how do you sell your original work if you don't sell online? I rent a booth and I'm actually considering um, getting out of that game. <laughs> but currently I rent a booth um, in a local antiques mall and sell my stuff that way. I just kind of package it up. I mat it and put it in. Well, I should say I used to mat it and put it in clear bags. Now all I've had the time to do is just put watercolors in clear bags and price them because I, uh, I just really have more on my plate than I that I can cope with. <laughs> Something's got to give. Something's got to give. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be the thing that doesn't make me very much money. Probably, which would be the the school. But it probably requires more work than yeah than it's worth. Um, but I'm thinking about doing like a big like potluck type, you know, grab bag super sale or something, and I'll just be like, okay, three sixteen by twenties for X amount. Of, you know, first you know, just kind of like this is what I got. Package them all up in bundles and. Let that's people a buy idea. a bundle of just so I can get it out because I, I don't know I don't see myself as ever the type of person that's gonna sit that's gonna want to sit down and run an online shop. Ugh, so much work. It's so much work, and it's just I don't I don't like sitting at the computer. My back doesn't like me sitting at the computer. Um, well, sitting is the new smoking. It is the new smoking. Know? Yes, I do. It's uh, I just don't I don't enjoy that. Uh, v Rock. This is a this was a person who asked about the Derwent versus Staedtler. Oh, okay. Uh, Derwent watercolor pencils are artist grade. Uh, paid sixty five for a set of seventy two. One review on Amazon said they seem too dry and scratchy. I tend to agree compared to Staedtler. User error. Huh. User error. Oh well, he's thinking maybe is it something he's doing or is it the pencil? Well, the other thing I have to say is that I don't, I, my, my set is pretty old. So they're the, the, the new gray case. I have the one with the gray casings 
and um, it's probably I think I've I think I got mine before I even had kids. So my son's almost fifteen. So I know, can you believe it? No, be driving soon. I know it's scary. So I mean, they could have changed the formula. That happens sometimes, um, but I haven't heard anything. Um, I would probably contact Derwin. Maybe there's some counterfeits. Oh, I didn't think of that. That's true. You know, I mean, who knows if a product gets really popular, sometimes there are counterfeits or sometimes they and list. They, they have, they have counterfeiting problems on Amazon. Like Birkenstock will no longer sells oh, really? their sandals on Amazon because they were having such problems with people uh, counterfeiting Birkenstocks and selling them. Yeah. I mean, it's fine. You can still order them through the Birkins, but you can't, right. you know, you can't oh go on gosh. Amazon. You can't get that free two day prime shipping like you could before. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you just got to trust it, you know, know the seller and trust them. Yep. You know, uh, Springer, Maine, Lindsay, you mentioned adding honey to your paint to prevent cracking like M Graham paints do. Do you have to do this to many brands of paint? I just had this problem with a Daniel Smith color. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think the only time you really have to add honey is on like a student grade paint. This is a ultramarine burnt sienna. Um, Otherwise, they usually there's usually like a perfect blend for drawing in a palette. So I would say if if you're not having a problem with them, don't add it. But with some of Daniel Smith's colors, the like the Primatex, they're made of a um, of a natural. They have like minerals and stuff, and sometimes they might not behave like the synthetic colors you're used to. So that could be an issue. Um, one thing that I do with Daniel Smith colors is that. I buy the sticks instead if they're available instead of the tubes. For one thing, it's cheaper for the exact same paint, but it's also formulated to be um, to be dry. So it will. Um, it pr it's pretty much their their stick is not great for drawing. It's pretty much like a pan that you hold in your hand, basically. And uh, that's that's what I do. And they do have some Primatex like that. I have a Sodalite in a stick and Serpentine Genuine in a stick, and they they perform really well. And there's no crumbling. They, they just stay in their stick form. I slice a piece off and stick it in a palette when I want to use it, and it works really good. So that would be I, I wouldn't ex I, you know Daniel Smith's a fine brand of paint, so I would not expect them to be not artist quality. But I think it's probably some of the Primatech colors. Like they're not going to rewet as well as others just because the nature of the beast. That's why we have synthetic colors. They've made they found better, cheaper ways to make a lot of our colors. And um, the the synthetic the the Primatechs are kind of a romantic you know, notion, because they kind of harken back to the, you know, the old masters and what they would use. But a lot of those things they used back then were not better than what we have today. So, you know, I think that's kind of case in point. But sure, go ahead and add a little honey to it if that if that's going to solve your problem. Just rambled on and on kind of for all, all you right. asked me to be anyway. <laughs> um, so I kind of like how dark I've gotten that petal and the colors, how they're going. So I'm going to start working around on these other petals again and bringing up the saturation on some of those colors. Now, something else that's kind of cool that you probably don't think of is that you can go in and adjust the background. If you decide that your background's too bright and you want to tone it down, you could go in with a glaze of, you could mix like your thalo blue and your um, your permanent red violet and get like a deep purple that's very transparent. You could go over everything and like kind of really turn down the saturation and the in the um, value of that if you wanted to so don't be afraid if you get your foreground and you're like geez i don't know if i like what i did there you can alter it i'm going to turn my picture as i work because it's just a easier for me to work on this part here upside down and i want to get some of those purple shades in there because i really like the way those look Blue's a little strong. That phthalo blue is so bright. Into the ultramarine, I think. And if you're just starting out, you are so much better to off to get a, a split primary palette of good quality paints than you know a set of 48 of student grade paints because you're going to learn how to mix and you're going to learn what colors you like. And then as you add, and then if you add a tube of color here and there, you're going to learn like what each color does instead of being having a bunch thrust on you at once and then not really knowing what to do with them. That is a little on the bold side. So I'm going to just wet my brush, blot it a little bit and soften it out. Did 
just beware of the hard edges as you're going. And you can blot if you get too much. Like that's a little dark, so I'm gonna try blotting with my a clean spot and a paper, paper towel, and that lightens it up perfectly. I'm gonna use a little bit of that warm yellow to warm up the petal because I can't really see much that I added the last time. Just try not to let it overlap your purple, or it will get a little muddy. And I'm going to move over to this guy again and get a little bit more of, I'm doing a lot of purple in this layer. I'm just adding a little bit of that purple mix to that grayish mix that I had on my palette. So just keep dipping into colors you've already used because they're going to go. You've used them as long as you cleaned your palette before you started this painting. Your colors should match pretty well. Heiko, for a warm yellow, would you suggest cad yellow medium or deep? Uh, you can use either. Cad Yellow Deep is going to be a little bit more orangey. Mm, orangey. And there are orangey lilies. Oh, yeah. I like the Stargazer lilies. Yeah, I do. I like those, too. I'm noticing a little bit of blue in that, just on its own. I'm going to grab some of this right here. Kind of slow process to uh, <laughs> to do these. All right, I want to make up a little bit more gray. I really like the gray that I got with the red and my mixed green. And then too much yellow there, but I like to balance those uh, those colors. It's kind of makes you makes a nice gray. And plus, you're integrating so many colors that you've used that it, uh, it kind of makes everything harmonize really well. I'm going to soften that a little bit more before it dries. There. All right. And then a little bit more blue, ultramarine to that, too, to tone it down a little bit. And now I'm going to put some shadows. And I think I will switch to a smaller brush because that just holds a ton of water. I'm going to stick with the mid mix, though, because I'm really having great luck with these brushes. Um, grab some of like a number four round and I'm going to put shadows on the petal on the, uh, this petal where they're cast by the, um, the stamen and this thing, I don't know what it's called. It's, I don't know what's a stamen and what the other thing, the pistons are. I think that's probably a piston. I don't know, but that's what I'm putting the shadows in for. You're gardening, you probably know what they are. I'm sorry, well, I wasn't listening. I was answering a question about hot press versus cold press. Oh, like the stamens and the pistons and mm -hmm. all those things. What's, what's what? Do you know? The... No. <laughs> the pointy things and all the flowers. So I'm putting the shadows from the pointy things. Yeah, cold press is smooth. Hot press is texture. Oh, no. Uh, hot press is smooth. <laughs> See? I knew. I was like, I know I'm going to get it wrong. Think about, like, ironing it. You iron your clothes with a hot iron. It makes them smooth. Well, yeah, it makes sense now. But I was trying to be impressive, and I got it wrong. But that's why I double-checked. You are impressive. In so many ways. Yes. Oh, by the way, so I ended up keeping your twinkle type. My what? <laughs> the twinkle type, the thing, some of the things you brought over to share. Oh, yeah. Get rid of crap um, yeah. that we had. Yeah, I ended up keeping a few things. <laughs> I saw we're still here. Like, oh, Sarah. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's, but, you know, you'll be able to use it, right? Yes. He was like, oh, so I'm packing stuff. I'm like, what is this? I don't remember. This isn't. Oh, Sarah must have brought oh, this wait, over. This is Sarah's stuff. Well, I'll take oh, that. Look at this. <laughs> I'm actually glad that nobody else brought stuff because I would have been tempted. <laughs> Free craft stuff. I can't help myself. 
but I will use a twinkle type because I love to glitter chipboard letters. Right. I just, I used what I did and I, I, I'd had them for a couple of years and they were just sitting in a drawer. I was like, somebody, somebody will be able to use them for something rather than just sitting in a drawer not being used. Is that the dog or is that something knocking on the door? Dog, I think. Oh. Uh, Linda DB would like you to tip the canvas so she can kind of see more on screen. Oh. Tip like that? I guess. I didn't realize that. It looks like I'm on screen from here. It, I would just tip it. Uh, that she just said to see. I don't know. Maybe I, I had, maybe there's glare the way it was. I'll maybe. tip it this way. See if that helps. So you can see it's kind of addictive. You could really keep playing and building up color. Um, oh, I think what it is, if I tip it like this, you can see a, you can see the shadows a little mm -hmm. bit better because you're not you're kind of tipped away from the light. So maybe that's what she means. I'll leave it like this for a few minutes so she can get her bearings a little bit. And let's see. I think I want to warm up that petal a little bit too. Leaves a little of that warm yellow. Still feel like I wish I had a. I was going to get my big glass plate, but I was just like, my pans are going to be dancing all over the place. And mm -hmm. that will be irritating. Uh, Carol Reed, any suggestions for putting sample paper through paces to see which to buy later? I just received a sample. I just received samples of Legion Castell Aquarelle. Um, just paint on them. I'll just paint on them. Maybe if you have like something you paint a lot or something you feel real conf confident about painting, um, you could try painting the same thing on each paper and then, uh, and then see what you like the feel of, what you like the workings of. It can be kind of tricky because a lot of times with samples, you feel a little stingy because you don't have very much to go by, you know, to go from. So, and I'm just putting in some really watered down yellow highlights here. Um, but if you can find something that you like, maybe something that you would maybe give as a card. So just like a, a pretty little flower or a little landscape that you like to paint. Something that you could paint over and over again, not get too bored, but you can actually use when you're done. That way you won't feel like you're wasting the paper. Um, I would do that a few times and that would really give you a good, a good idea of what you're painting. I don't like that color. I think I got into the wrong yellow or something. So it looks a little bizarre. Okay, so now we're going to work on the centers. I'm actually going to dry this real quick with my heat tool just to make sure that I don't have any wet paint around. If you have any questions, go ahead and uh, ask Sarah. I do like the snow. It looks like snowflakes. I think this is a very main Easter painting. <laughs> it doesn't look like snowflakes, Lindsay. Stop with the madness. It does. Because like you could be having a perfectly nice spring day, the crocuses are up, everything's fine and dandy, then snowstorm. This time of year, I'm going to mix, uh, I think I'm going to actually pick the yellow first. I'm going to go with that nice um, bright yellow, this nice medium. I think it was called, what was it called? This is a weird name. It's permanent azo yellow, but it's, it is very, very warm. I'm stabbing them in. Actually, the nice thing about this yellow, it's quite transparent for a yellow. A lot of yellows are kind of opaque, and they get muddy real quick because of how opaque they are when you mix with them. That's usually what makes your paints, your watercolors feel a little muddy. It's because the paint you're mixing with is um, is opaque rather than transparent, or it's a warm color rather than a cool color, because warm colors do tend to be a little more opaque generally. So this would be a, good, a great mixing color. Now I'm going to grab some burnt sienna, and I'm just going to dab uh, some of that on there. I don't think I got very much. And then if I do get little cauliflowers, that will be fine because this is like a, um, you know, it's got that pollen, it's very textured. So I'd be totally fine with this kind of making little cauliflowers or kind of having some interesting textures in there. Homeschool for two. What type of paper would be similar to you, Bo? I don't really 
really know of any other paper that's like Yupo. It's kind of its own thing, um, being a very, you know, slippery synthetic paper. Uh, there is one by Canson called, um, oh, what's it called? Aquarius. Canson Aquarius paper is a blend. It's, I believe it's synthetic and cotton, and it doesn't, it's very thin, but it doesn't tend to buckle. Um, but it behaves a little bit more like a paper paper, but it but it has a synthetic mix in there that keeps it from buckling for such a thin sheet. I don't think it's discontinued, right? I mean, you don't see it very often, but it's called Aquarius or Aquarius 2 by Canson, I believe. If it's not Canson, it's Strathmore, but I'm thinking it's Canson. But it might be Strathmore, so just Google, go to Jerry's and Google Aquarius 2. And perhaps use a coupon on and it. And use that coupon. On sale. Use your coupon. At least you get your free shipping anyway. Mm, free shipping. Yeah, it's so funny how conditioned we are about the free shipping because, like, I, I'll be looking at something and I'll be like, oh, that's a great price. But, and like, even if it's still cheaper with like the shipping cost than it is from like, you know, any other store, I'll be like, well, that's not free shipping. <laughs> <laughs> what? Or I'll catch myself sometimes, you know, free shipping with orders over X number of dollars and I'll be, you know, off. And I'm like, well, I gotta order yep. twenty dollars more to save that ten dollars shipping. And I'm oh, like, this yeah. is ridiculous. Just order what you need. And well, that's me. No, call me up, Lindsay. I'm ordering from. <laughs> need anything? <laughs> Don't want to pay shipping. <laughs> shipping? That's outrageous. People pay that? Yeah, especially like on Etsy because there's so many cute things. And it's like, well, shipping. Okay. Oh my gosh. That's well, I mean, ridiculous. they have to pay it too. I know. I, I have to pay for shipping. Shipping stinks. But <laughs> it's almost like I don't want to know about it. It's like, I don't know. What, I don't want to know what's in the sausage. I don't want to know what shipping costs. <laughs> well, and I think we forget too that for a lot of us, especially in rural areas, a lot of time the shipping can be cheaper than trying to drive around small towns or yes. driving to a larger oh, city. Yeah. Still trying to get what we need when you can just do it with a couple of clicks yeah yeah not to mention um the fact that you go into a store you spend more money because you're tempted I know. at least i am maybe maybe you're not i mean of course we spend more when we go when we have to get a free shipping minimum up but you know it de it depends because you're just looking for trouble when you go into a store <laughs> it depends sometimes i've i've gotten better over the years about not going overboard when i do go into a store to buy And ground the center of this flower with a little bit more of that green. It was a little too bright, so I added some ultramarine. Ultramarine is, uh, um, it's a less green blue, so it's going to cool things down without really um, making, with, and it's going to cool it down and desaturate it because it's it's not the blue you use. It's kind of the opposite blue you would pick. But they low blue is a blue you use to make a bright green. Ultramarine will give you a dull green. So if you use ultramarine to cool down a green, it'll desaturate it as well, which is what I needed here because it was too bright. And saturation is just how bright a color is. If you ever you're on Instagram and you're playing with saturation, you know you can turn it up and make your photos look really bright. You can turn it down, make them look more sepia or black and white. It's just how much color you have in there. when you adjust one area, you often have to go and adjust another area because you've made something darker here. you got to make sure everything agrees. And sometimes if something doesn't quite match up in your photo, you just kind of have to fake it and, and you have to do things to make the, the painting a little bit more appealing. That's why you can't rely on reference photos too much because you have to use your own mind and remember how things look. Use your own experiences to figure out how dark something should be, where the color should be. Homeschool for two. Have you ever tried watercoloring with acrylic or alcohol inks? Uh, yeah, I've done it with acrylic before. It works quite well. Um, on paper, you don't have to worry about underbinding, so you can go ahead and mix water in. Uh, of course, you can glaze over very easily because it's not going to lift up as you go and put more layers on top. But the downside is, you know, if paint dries on you in the palette, it's wasted. It's gone. Um, but you don't need very much. So, and acrylic paint's fairly cheap, so you don't have to um, 
worry about that too much. What are you laughing about? Really? Huh? She's just big sigh and she's looking at me and it's very hard being chewy. Oh. Uh, Pepper Hearts, what is the name of the green that you're using? It's a mixture of um, of lemon, yellow, and thalo, thalo blue. And I have like added a little ultramarine here and there to dull it down. But that's pretty much what we got going on. I don't have any premix green in this uh, from these colors. I just was mixing everything from the colors that came in the uh, in the little set that I got at Jerry's. I'm surprised I still have those left because I bought mine. It was like right after Christmas and I kind of hemmed and hawed. And I will tell you guys though, that that set comes with, it also comes with a um, Kalinsky Sable brush. So if you do not want an animal hair brush, that's going to come with an animal hair brush. So I do want to let you know that. Um, I it didn't say that in the listing when I bought it. I don't know if it does now, but, um, and, but for those of you that love Kalinsky Sable, because they are expensive, you get a Kalinsky Sable brush. I just wanted to, forgot to mention that earlier. But I want to just kind of, I couldn't believe it, believe that price. I went to Michael's and the block, the watercolor block that I got in that set was 60 something dollars, you know, and it was, you know, the whole set with the paints and the brush was in the cakes was only 49. Yikes. Yeah. I think it's like a $200 set on clearance. So they probably won't be they're probably not getting any more, but. All right. So I'm just kind of fussing with the little shadows and. Kind of looking at my picture more than the reference photo just seeing where i feel like it needs more like this looks so white it's very white in the reference photo but i think i need to um i need to alter it a bit don't be shy with the water because um because you can't it's it's tougher to light it lighten it up so you might as well kind of go in gen gingerly when you're on a white petal like this. All right, for that center, it's kind of um, like a light green gray. Let's add a little bit of yellow to this ultramarine blue here. So I'll get kind of a dulled out green. Homeschool for two. What is the best inexpensive watercolor paper? Um... I'd probably say Strathmore 400 series or Strathmore Wind Power. Shall remain nameless. Have you used cotton rag paper? This is a cotton rag paper. This one right here. Uh, yeah, that I that is a that's probably the highest quality paper for watercolor, and it works wonderfully. Right, I think I'll leave the center like that for now, and it does need a little bit of shadow underneath. Um, I think I'll do burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, and grab a little premixed, a uh, little green that I mixed, just a little dab of it. And then if I need any other shadows, I like to add a little blue. You just want to be careful not to get anything too um, dead in color, too like too brown um, on a floral, especially a white floral, because it will really kill the energy. Best at 469. I read Kalinske's are more firm than other watercolor brushes. I thought you want the softest brush possible. If I'm wrong, what is the benefit of a firmer watercolor brush? Um, you want different, it depends on the effects that you want. So if you don't want to hold a bunch of water and you want um, really controlled strokes, a Kalinsky is going to be, or a, or a faux Kalinsky like these mimics are going to give you that result. If you're doing a background, if you need to carry a lot of paint and water to your paper, you want something more soft and absorbent like a swirl. If you're paint or a faux swirl like I have here, if your brush is too um, soft, it's not going to hold a point. So a lot of times they mix different fibers together to give you a brush that's going to hold a lot of water and yet also retain a point. A Kalinsky or faux Kalinsky retains a nice point because of the spring in the fur. And the squirrel is a, or like a goat hair any, or any really soft, fluffy brush might hold the tons and tons of water, but it's not going to give you any control. So you can't really, it'll hold it. But when it comes to putting it somewhere, you don't have the control. So it's just like um, you, it depends on what you're going for and I like to get a brush that kind of balances both of those qualities. 
like these uh, these mimics hold a ton these uh, mimic faux squirrels hold a lot of water but they also have good resiliency and good snap not as much snap as, as the Kalinskis. If I had to worry about how much water I was getting in an area and I wanted a little more control over my water, then I would go with the Mimic Kalinsky if um, if I want to hold a bunch of a bunch of water. Um, and I wasn't worried about getting too much, I'd go with the squirrel. I usually go with the squirrel. So there's not all or nothing. And then they'll then like some people like just plain water brushes or uh, just plain synthetic brushes. It's it's personal preference. I think for a beginner, you'd be better off to start with the Mimic Kalinskis or like an Ebony Splendor or a Royal Aqualon or Majestic because you're not going to get so much water that it's cumbersome. If you get too much in there, then especially with student grade paints that are a little weaker, you, you have too much water and a weaker paint, it can be um, your, water, your colors can look very wishy-washy and um, you can have a real hard time getting the saturation and color concentration that you want. So there's all these different variables because people paint differently and people need to get different effects in their paintings. Now I want to put a little shadow on this and I think I'm just going to use this kind of ultramarine bluey green here. See how it's kind of like a cool greenish shadow? Hopefully that shows up on camera. Paula Haynes, are Rembrandt's light fast? Oh yeah, they are. They are fantastic. I kicking myself because I saw a really good deal on the set of 48 half pans, but it was like right after Christmas and I didn't need any watercolors. I still don't need any watercolors, but if that price came up again, I would totally grab it. But it was like a set of the 48 half pans. Oh, kicking myself. But I'd never tried it before. And I'm like, this is ridiculous to even, you know, consider spending that kind of money on a paint you've never tried. But yeah, they're light fast. They're fantastic. They do tend to be kind of expensive. So if you find a deal, then, uh, then that's time. That's the time to get them. But they also have the Van Gogh line. If you're um, if you want to spend only like maybe three bucks a tube between between three and five dollars a tube, you can try the Van Gogh line. Those are fantastic. They have a lot of single pigment colors, um, and a lot of professional artists use them. They're the student line from this this uh, from this paint company, so uh, they they do really good paint. Now I think I also want to have some of the uh, leaves for this flower, but I don't think I want to spend a ton of time on them. So I'm just going to kind of go you know, really quick with painting those. Um, I'm not sure what brush. I'll use the use the number twelve round. I'm gonna mix up a fairly dark green. I think I'll do some lemon. I think I'll do both yellows actually. And then I'm gonna do some phthalo blue. Actually, no. I think I'm gonna do both both blues and both yellows, so I get kind of a cool desaturated leaf color and I'm just going to paint some in. Now if you want to go in later with like colored pencils and add some of that striation that some of the leaves have you could totally do that but I think I want my focus to be on the flower itself and not the the leaves or stems so you can do whatever you want to do that's what I'm going to do here though. I think if you detail too much in a picture then you kind of lose the impact. Cat uh, Castaneris, is there an alternative to absorbent or watercolor ground when wanting to watercolor on canvas or other surfaces? Um, not that I know of, but I mean, I don't see, you know, it depends on if you have like a rigid surface, you might be able to take like plaster of Paris and um, kind of like, so you get kind of like a fresco type surface. You could probably paint that on there, but not on a flexible surface, not on a canvas because it will... Um, it will flake off so maybe I mean that that's tricky absorbent ground really does a great job for what it's meant to do I haven't used the core one but I've used the Daniel Smith absorbent ground and it's it's fantastic it's a great product and it it goes pretty far so I would recommend trying that uh, but if like you absolutely can't get it or didn't have the budget for it then you know you could try some plaster of Paris uh, Heiko, have you tried Claire Fontaine's cold press paper? No, I never heard of it. Monica Paula, what does Lindsay think about black velvet silver brushes? I've never used them. I think they're a synthetic swirl, but I'm not 100% sure. I've never used them. 
Robbie K. I got some water brushes, but I have arthritis in my hands, and it seems like I can't press hard enough to get water. Am I doing something wrong? Oh, I doubt it. There are just some brushes that that are like that. Um, I find the koi to be the to be pretty easy to squeeze. The pentels are fairly easy to squeeze, um, and then some are miserable. They're really difficult to squeeze. So um, I would contact the company that you got it from and explain your situation you might just have a bad one or they might say yeah our brushes are kind of difficult so i'm not surprised you're having that situation um but it never hurts to contact the company they may have a really good solution for you sometimes it, like once you get the um brush going it feeds on its own really well so they might suggest that maybe you have a bucket of water and you swirl it in the water before you go out to paint to get that um the tip wet and everything and so all it takes is one squeeze once you're out and the water will continuously feed uh so I don't, did he mention what brand he's using? He didn't know. Uh, so I would try that. That way, you know, let the company know. You might just have a bad one. I'm sure they would replace it if that was the case. The Primo ones are really nice and they're very inexpensive. Um, and they seem to be fairly easy to squeeze, but like they don't leak or anything. Joy Hawkins, do I have to dilute Daniel Smith watercolor ground or should it be used neat from tub? It seems a bit thick. I use it right from the tub. Just slap her on there. I do. I've done. I put it on um like tin tins, like little tin can, not tin cans, but you know, like gift tins, so that I could paint a watercolor on them. Um, I've used it to fix a painting, like I was doing an illustration for the sea glass book, and they needed something changed, and I just slapped on the. I painted where I needed to paint with a watercolor medium, and let it dry, and painted right over it. It's great stuff. All right, I think this is done. What do you think, Sarah? I think so. Sorry, I was answering a question about Brett. Someone was asking about real hair versus synthetic. Oh, yeah. And uh, as far as differences, and there isn't a difference, Lindsay uses the synthetic because she does not believe in using animal hair brushes because of the animals. Right. And how they're treated and how they're slaughtered and raised and not treated well. Mm -hmm. and, however, though, if you have, like, if your grandmother painted and she gave you her brushes. Don't throw them out. Don't throw them out. They will last a lifetime. With watercolor, it's such a gentle medium on your brushes that if you have them, use them. When you're done with them, give them to somebody else. Pass them along. You know, let the life be honored. But um, but I don't purchase new. and let, You know, I mean, obviously, I got that set of paints. I didn't know it was a Kalinsky brush that came in it. But, um, you know. Don't purposely go out. Yeah. That's not what you, you know, that's not yeah. what you do. Yeah. I'm not perfect, but, you know, if I if I have them, I'll use them because I don't want to waste them or I would give them to somebody. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, there's so many good versions now that are so good for the environment, good for your pocketbook, and are still going to last as long. Um, with watercolor, you can splurge on a brush and expect to keep it for a lifetime. And you can't say that with really any other medium. I mean, oils, if you're really good about cleaning them, but... Um, but it's hard to top the economic, the long-term economic um, sustainability of watercolors because they go a long way and the brushes last forever and paint's cheaper than canvas, paper's cheaper than canvas usually. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, is that it for questions? I think there was one last one. Let's see if I can get back up there. Uh, Patty Picasso, have you ever used polyfilla in art? Would it be a cheaper alternative to texture paste? I don't know what that is. He's uh, from he's from Galway, so it might polyfilla. be something that's European. Maybe it's it, maybe they mean like um, spackle or oh, it, yeah, Joe. It's not related to watercolor. Sorry, I didn't realize it wasn't a watercolor related question. Oh, oh well, um, I will since it's out here. I will add, I will answer it. So I'm not sure what polyfilla is, but um, you actually could use. I mean, if you want to slap a stencil there and scrape some texture paste over it and give it a make it mixed media. Um, I have used latex caulking, which is a um, it's a, like a vinyl or latex caulking, which is a product that people use for bathrooms and um, backsplashes and things like that to seal things. You can mix that with acrylic paint to tint it. You can mix it with watercolor even to tint it, and that would work. Um, I haven't used spackle. I think it might flake, um, and I haven't used joint compound either because I think it would flake on a flexible surface, but, but uh, definitely inexpensive white paintable latex caulking will work for that. Anything else? That's it. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for hanging out today. I do appreciate it. I hope you have a very safe and wonderful holiday. If you celebrate Easter, have a happy Easter. If not, have a wonderful weekend. Hopefully the weather will be nice where you are and you can get some painting done. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.